Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, joining us in today's session. Uh, my name is Phoebe Kagame from M. Shule. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, this is our fifth. Um, this is our fifth uh, M. Shule ICT webinar series and the first of the year. I'm pretty sure from our different experiences, we can attest that data collection is a critical part of running successful programs in East Africa from evaluating impacts to conducting research and also to writing donor reports. But why is it so difficult in this market? And is there any way to make it easier? In this conversation, we will bring together nonprofit programs, researchers and edtech companies to see how we can implement innovations and improve our data-driven action for impact. Our speakers will be Emma Landwitter from EDU, that is Education Design Unlimited, and Alice Kimani from VSO International in a conversation moderated by M. Shule CEO, Claire Mujo. This experience panel will talk about their experience with data collection. But before I hand over the session to the moderator, I would like to go over the house rules. Please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Again, as we go through the session, please send your question on the chat and I will keep track of these questions. The moderator will lead off with them during the Q&A session. We will also be sharing a, record, a recording of the session, as well as additional information and contact details. So thank you very much for being part of this session. Claire, I will hand it over to you. Great, thank you so much. And before we get started, uh, Phoebe, as our host, could you please uh, kindly start the recording? Great, awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. As Phoebe has mentioned, uh, my name is Claire Manjo. I am the CEO at M. Shule, and I'm really, really excited uh, today to be speaking with all of us about why is data collection so hard and how uh, can we use some innovations and strategies to make it easier? Um, why is it uh, important to actually talk about uh, data collection in the first place? Um, so we all know about the power of data, um, but when you're working in data for impact, especially in this region, we're often working with individuals from whom it, it is the most challenging to collect this data. Um, I uh, have had the experience of reading uh, research papers and watching presentations that talk about the methodology of data collection. And there's usually a nice little paragraph that says something like, oh, we conducted field interviews with 100 women, or we ran a written survey across 1,000 people. Uh, and then when it's time for me to do it myself, uh, all of a sudden, I'm faced with all these questions. How do you decide what methodology to do when you have a limited budget? How do you structure a good survey design? How do you find good sample respondents? How do you make sure that the surveyors or the facilitators or data collectors that you're using are giving you good data? How do you incentivize people? What happens when there are confounding factors? And again, all of this um, on limited budgets. So we're really going to be exploring the questions today of um, how can we collect data um, well? How can we set up good processes um, and overcome the challenges that we all find when collecting information? Um, and how can we do it uh, when we're budget constrained or when we have to consider funding? Um, so I'm really excited to have that conversation um, with everyone today. Before I keep going, I will ask our uh, presenters and our speakers to give a little bit of an introduction about themselves uh, and their organizations they're coming from. Um, so first, uh, Alice, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Claire. My name is uh, Alice Kemani. I work for Voluntary Service Overseas based in Kenya. I work uh, in Livelihoods uh, Project, Youth Employment and Entrepreneurship uh, Project. And I have had interaction with different NGOs and uh, different organizations and a background in uh, project management. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alice. Um, and our other presenter is Emma. So Emma, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Emma Muita. Um, I come here from Education Design Unlimited. We're an education consultancy firm based here in Nairobi. Um, my background is in more traditional education. I spent the last 13 years uh, predominantly working in schools, uh, first as a teacher and then moving into a curriculum designer, um, then to a teacher coach. 
Um, and for sort of the last four or five years in Nairobi, um, helping to lead the academics at Nova Pioneer. Um, I'm excited to be speaking um, from EDU today. Uh, much of the work that we do is very driven by data. Um, and I think we all experience some of the challenges uh, in figuring out how to collect that data um, and how do we make sure that we're talking to the right people, getting the right information to make decisions that help us to build our products. Um, so yeah, Claire, excited for the conversation. Awesome, thank you so much, Emma. Um, so as some of you may know uh, too about Mshule is we are an education technology platform. Um, we use SMS to send out micro courses and information to learners uh, of all ages who may not have uh, the internet or smartphones. So you can probably imagine we collect data through technology. Um, we have a platform that collects you know, SMS surveys and performance information, but we also do phone interviews. We also do school-based interviews. We also conduct focus groups and look for stories of success. So we're all asking uh, ourselves even these questions all the time. Um, and I think particularly in education and training uh, with our two great experts here today, um, getting the right type of data is really, really important because often you're not going to see an immediate, uh, you know, 100% increase in, in student academic results or that people will immediately, you know, go uh, increasing their incomes by, you know, 50%. The, this is a talking about transformation over time. And so collecting the right information along the way and at the right stage is particularly important. Um, and uh, especially I think for our community as well. So we'll, we'll have our discussion. Um, this is going to be a free flowing conversation. Again, as uh, our um, audience, please drop uh, questions into the chat or ideas that you have. And then when we get to the Q&A um, and discussion portion at the end, we'd love to hear more from you. Um, but for now, we're gonna talk about three major topics. Um, so firstly, uh, getting a bit more understanding of how uh, Emma and Alice are interacting with data, how they currently collect data as part of their work, what they use it for. Um, then we'll get into the nitty gritties of the fun stuff and the challenges that come up um, when we're getting this data from, um, from, these, uh, from the individuals and communities that we're working with. And then finally, we'll talk about what are some of the learnings and the solutions and, and tips and tricks uh, that we've learned along the way, as well as what are some asks that we have of the community, things that we can work on together and, and pioneer thought leadership in this uh, fun and exciting space. Uh, so with that, I'll go into our first uh, portion. So um, getting a little bit of an idea of the status quo. Um, what type of data are you currently collecting? Um, what processes are you currently using? Um, and how are you using it? Um, so I, I made, uh, I asked Alice to introduce herself first. So maybe Emma, you can uh, kick this portion off. Okay, thanks. Uh, data collection in the organization that I work for is, uh, it's, a, it's a process that starts with the end in mind. And uh, in most of our programming, we have a logical framework that we use uh, for the uh, different projects that we have. So the process actually starts uh, collecting the data from, the, from identifying the impact or the outcome that we want to assess. Then we come down to the output uh, and the activities that uh, we want to assess in the project. So uh, once we have the end in mind, we identify the different indicators that are required for certain uh, data sets. And this, we have used the uh, different data, data collection tools like questionnaires, we have used uh, interviews, key informant interviews. We have also used uh, digital tools like Hobo tools, whereby people are able to log in online and input their data. And uh, recently we have been using Mshule to assess data and uh, to collect data of our primary actors. And this Please unmute. Um, Alice, would you please unmute? Was I unmute? Yes. For a little yes. bit, yes. <laughs> Just back up a little bit. Where did you lose me? 
Um, you've been using digital tools, also like Mshule, and I think then you were explaining some of how uh, the data yes. has been collected. Sawa. So in a nutshell, data collection is an ongoing process, both for monitoring and evaluation of the project. And uh, it's a process that uh, requires uh, due diligence because we have to get the right data. We have to get the data from the right people so that we do not give the wrong information. Remember, anytime you give uh, garbage in, you get garbage out. So it's a whole process that requires a lot of attention. Thank you. Great. And um, just, uh, just to ask a little bit more about the process. So it sounds like you're using a combination of um, uh, direct to the respondent tools, maybe where they're giving information directly. And then it sounds like there's some intermediary tools like um, are, are people going out and, and conducting questionnaires with the primary actors and then they're entering it into Kobo? Can you go into that process a little bit more? Yeah, the whole process uh, starts from uh, our staff and the volunteers going out to the primary actors and they're able to collect uh, raw data from the primary actors. And this, this data is collected through interviews or questionnaires that, uh, that we use. Then the data is processed through uh, either Excel or uh, Kobo tool. And the Kobo tool, again, it's able to be linked up to data analysis uh, system. Like currently we are using Power BI for analysis of our data. So we are able to link up the data tool to the Power BI. And the, from the Power BI, you, you can be able to analyze the data and get a report for the data that you have collected. Great. So, so the, the BSO team is going out and collecting this information through conversations, interviews, questionnaires, and then they're entering the data into Excel or to this Kobo tool, and then you're getting the, the outputs. Yes, sure. Great. And how long does this, uh, the field data collection typically take when you're sending out the, the team to collect this information? <laughs> The field, team, uh, the field team can take as long as uh, the, the scope of the data that you want. Sometimes we want to collect data from uh, all our beneficiaries, and which is a large number. Like currently in, uh, in my team, we did an assessment that we are collecting data from uh, 1,000 plus uh, primary actors. And uh, we require a lot of resources in this work because they have to go out and uh, reach out to the, to the primary actors themselves in terms of facilitation and everything. So the process can be quite cumbersome. And uh, first, if you don't get the right people to do that job, you could end up uh, getting the wrong information and the wrong details that you're looking for. So we have to take them through a training whereby we take them through the tools that we want to assess the, through the primary actors so that they can pass the same to the primary actors and get the information that is, that is uh, required. Great, so very human intensive, it sounds like. Very intensive. Great, and I, I think we're, we're that this is the type of stuff that we'll definitely dig in uh, in the next section, but um, thank you so much, Alice. So Emma, I'm sure, uh, you know, you, I know with your work, um, you do a lot of different research um, for a lot of different types of projects. So we'd love to hear what are the similarities and differences in your data collection process um, compared to what Alice just said. Absolutely. Um, and so I think part of being a consultancy firm is it means we get asked to do a variety of different types of projects. So data plays an important role, but it looks different for each project. Um, at EDU, our focus is to design learning experiences. And there are sort of two key places where I think we really use research to guide the process. First is in a product development process, right, where we need to determine the product for the right user group. Um, for example, right now we're doing a project where we've needed to, to do one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews to help us determine if we're building the right product for a user. The challenge, of course, of one-on-one -on -one interviews is, is finding the right people. Um, and so for this, right, you know, is about finding partner organizations who would provide us access to the types of individuals that we wanted to speak to, right? Then working with the partner organization to schedule. After that, we then needed to go through the training of our research team to make sure that they were able to lead the interviews and then actually sending them into the field. Um, of course, uh, for those of you um, who are based here in Kenya, um, you know that there's 
quite a lot of variety uh, when it comes to making sure you're talking to the right people. So for example, we focused a lot of our interviews in Nairobi and realized that we were missing some really important perspectives from outside of Nairobi. Um, and that then meant we needed to go do research in Nakuru. And there were other areas that were recommended as well. Um, but of course, as Alice shared, right, it's quite people intensive. Um, and you need to make sure that you're getting in front of the right people. So that's sort of uh, one type of, of research that we do. When we do that, we then sort of take those interview notes and then we synthesize and use that information to sort of make meaning around how we think about the product we're going to create. Another project we recently did with Acumen um, was very different, right? This is sort of from the research arm um, of our organization. We do education-based research or research around youth employment. Um, Acumen asked us to dig in and try to understand the needs in Kenya specifically for supplemental learning materials from an e-learning perspective. Um, the ask was that we found a way to get um, a minimum of 2,000 data points from school owners, teachers, and parents. Um, Mshuli knows a lot about this. They worked really closely with us. For this one in particular, there were two ways we thought about collecting data. The first was a survey-based approach, and the second was again using one-on-one -on -one interviews to help validate the data we were collecting. Um, as Mshule could probably attest, it was an adventure. Um, it was the first time we'd ever done research at this scale, um, and there were a lot of learnings that came from it. Um, a couple of key things that came out for us, I think, as Alice already shared, was making sure we were collecting the right information. Um, and so we went through our survey multiple times with multiple lenses, then realized we had way too many questions, then tried to cut it down, then felt like we were losing things, right? It was this battle of like, how do we make sure we ask the right things, get the right information? Um, and then was the, was sort of, how do we get it out? Um, so again, going through partner organizations, trying to find listservs, uh, realizing that, you know, a huge group of course is blocked when it comes to, um, online surveys. Um, so then needing to transition to SMS based surveys and realizing even then, right, you need to modify how the survey is structured. So there were just so many different pieces that came in. Um, in the end, we got a ton of data. It was unbelievably useful. Um, and it was a great learning process for us. Um, but I think it definitely shows that particularly the, the finding the right people is so important. And how do you make sure you're getting that access, I think is key when you think about data. Awesome. And um, to, to, there were two really big things that you know came out when you were talking about how you collect data and even getting into some of the big considerations we need to think about. Um, and so one uh, was thinking about how are you making sure you're getting good data in and then how are you also making sure um, you're getting it that data from the right people. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Alice this question, um, because I think you echoed that sentiment that a lot of us are looking at data feel, which is, you know, garbage in, garbage out, you can't make good decisions, you can't put together good reports, if the data you get is um, not quality. What are the challenges in making sure the data is good? Um, what have you dealt with uh, you know, in your processes um, that have uh, been those fault points or been those issues um, and what have been some of the impacts? Uh, uh, some of the challenges that have, uh, that have faced in the, in the process of collecting data is uh, one, getting data from uh, the wrong target group. Like you go out looking for data from the primary actors but you get data from people who are not even uh, your beneficiaries. So uh, you, end up, you could end up getting the wrong data thinking that you have the right data. Two, getting data that has errors or missing information, and uh, these you are not able to analyze the data to give you the information that you need. And again, uh, if you get the uh, late uh, submission of data, uh, data is supposed to be timely. If uh, data is submitted uh, lately, then you are not able to transit the same to the to the donors and uh, to the project team and uh, the whole the whole process could go haywire. And lastly, is a lack of database that can keep track of the data. 
if you don't have a database, then you will just keep on piling papers in the office. And uh, if some, uh, if you leave the office, uh, it becomes very, very difficult for someone to follow up what you're doing. But if uh, there is a, a database that is live that you can be able to track, like for example, the beneficiaries, the process that you have gone through, how far they are, then someone else uh, uh, would be able to catch up very easily if they joined uh, the organization. Then uh, in part of the solutions to these uh, challenges is uh, one, getting the right uh, infrastructure. And uh, this could be in form of a, a database system, an IT system. We know everything uh, nowadays has, uh, has been digitalized. So it's important for organizations to get a database system that is uh, live that can be able to track the progress and the processes in the, in the project. Two, uh, potential data improving, in improving programming and concept uh, development. So if you have data and uh, someone is asking for a concept in something, you are able to collect this data and uh, get the information that can, uh, that can be developed into a concept and maybe win a concept paper for, for donors and for programming in that, in that area. Then uh, getting the right information, this cannot be under, this, this can only be underscored. Getting the right information and getting the right people who are getting the information. Then getting data from uh, 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 having data protection uh, policy. And I will mention maybe when we are finalizing this uh, conversation, I can take through the, the principles that are in the data protection policy so that we can be able to identify and uh, be in the know-how of the guidelines in the data plot protection policy. Thank you. Mm, awesome. Yeah, I think you highlighted a lot of things that I have definitely experienced. But of course, Emma, what, what about you? What have been these, these gaps in being able to get actually good data coming into the program in the first place? Yeah, um, I, think, I think it's a really good question. There's a couple of things that come up to me that I think are sort of unique uh, for some of the challenges that we've faced. Um, I'd say the sort of first big bucket is for the most part, when we when we approach data collection, we're working really closely with partner organizations to access the right people. Um, so for example, right, if you're doing research with refugees, you're likely going to organizations that work with refugees to then get access to that particular group. Um, and I think what we've noticed is that when we think about partner organizations, there's a wide variance in their willingness to engage with your research, right? So that I think can be one barrier. Um, we've had some incredible partners who've been unbelievably helpful and have made this process really smooth. We've also had partners who have um, sort of either felt like I'm not really sure if I want to help you collect this data. I don't really see what's in it for me. Um, or I'm expecting a certain amount of, um, of funding to come in order to make these connections for you. Um, and of course, right, there are times when that can be cost prohibitive. It can be a challenge for you to actually be able to get access to the right people. Um, so I think that's, that sort of comes up for us as we're thinking about how do we get to the right individuals so we get the right information. Um, then I think the second barrier is around what's the right, the best tool to collect the data. Um, so as I said before, um, you know, there's SMS, which we know enables us to connect to a broader group who are using, you know, feature phones, um, you know, that then is sort of at the cost of the person collecting that research. Um, things we learned there that were as challenge, um, SMS surveys are expensive. Uh, you don't necessarily think that immediately. I didn't. Um, but it ended up being a lot more expensive than we anticipated. Um, and it also requires that you structure your survey in a certain way. So you need to know things around how do you format your questions? What's the number of um, characters you can have? All of that to make sure that your surveys for SMS or for an online survey are the same, right? Um, so you're collecting the apples for apples data. Um, of course, you know we all know how to use a Google survey, I'm assuming. Those ones are quite simple, but they cut out a huge group. Um, and so I think that was, you know, 
a learning around how are we building the right tool to collect the right data. And then, right, when do you make the decision to have uh, one-on-ones or focus groups be part of your data collection? Um, we tend, when we do sort of any uh, SMS or Google survey data, we then try to do either focus groups or one-on-one -on -one interviews with the different groups we collected the data from to try to see if in the conversation, it matches what we data collected, right? The reason there is, it just is another check to make sure that what's coming in is representative, right? And we're able then to add the language, the color, the stories, the nuance um, that can bring, right, those numbers that you see um, in a survey that can bring them to life, right? And so I think that um, that definitely helps, but it's also, again, a challenge to find those people and make sure you're asking the right people the right questions. Um, I think Alice mentioned the sort of paper approach. One of the things we ran into um, was a, a lot of partners saying, well, yeah, but if you print this out, will then take it to some people and they can fill it out. Um, and so some of those challenges around um, transitioning people from paper to paperless and helping them understand why we were choosing a specific approach um, that didn't involve sort of manual data entry. So that was another piece that we encountered. Um, and then last but not least, I think, you know, when we, when we build a research team, there's a lot of work we put into upskilling our researchers to be able to go in and engage um, with the different groups. So that is one of the things we've seen where we have, um, where I think there's opportunities to continue to develop um, researchers in general, right? Um, to be able to have more nuanced conversations, to be able to kind of follow the flow of the discussion. Um, and so making sure your researchers are quite strong so that when they go into the field, they can really bring back the most meaningful data. So I think those are some of the, the different areas that we've um, noticed as we think about, um, about challenges that we've faced. Um, and I actually think Peter just flagged one from the research side of things. Um, where you know we also have to be really thoughtful about who we send into the field to have conversations. Um, so, for example, you know if we're leading sensitive conversations with women, um, we want to make sure that we are we have a probably all female research team. We likely want to ensure that they are you know they speak Kiswahili fluently. We may need to think about translators if we're speaking um, in communities that maybe aren't as comfortable in Swahili. So I think there's also all these layers when you're doing one-on-one -on -one or focus groups that you have to make sure you're putting together that right team. Great. Yeah, and um, the, there was a question that was asked uh, before, you know, in, in the pre-survey uh, when people are registering too, is how do you ensure that the, the data that you're getting is correct? Um, and this is true across surveys and across, you know, these one-on-one -on -one groups and the focus groups. A lot of times when people are coming in, um, I think sometimes we might see that uh, people will just say something that you want to hear. Uh, maybe that they assume, oh, you know, this project or this program has given me, um, you know, support in the past. And so I'm just going to tell them everything's great. So they keep giving me support, et cetera. Um, is that something that you found and how have you dealt with it? Um, I'll throw this out. Alice, has, is that something that you've dealt with before? Yes, yes, Claire, this is something that we have experienced in the project, especially when you're conducting evaluation and the primary actors want to see, want you to see that there was change, even if there was no change. So sometimes they will get to cook data. You ask, you may ask them how much, uh, how much have you increased your income? And now they, they just give uh, just, uh, just a figure to show that the income has increased yet the income has increased, has, hasn't increased. So in this case, uh, when we are getting this information, we give them a thorough brief that the information that they should give should be the true value and the true figure of what is happening so that they do not end up uh, exaggerating figures and giving you the wrong information. Then we make them aware that 
whatever information that you give, it will help us in improving the programming. So if you tell us that your income has already increased, then we'll think you're doing good and next time we'll not uh, probably help you out. So we just uh, make them understand that the information should be true and uh, they should be honest and the issue of integrity while providing this, uh, this information. Awesome, that's a really good tip. Sorry, go ahead, Emma. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, Alice, I think um, I definitely appreciate sort of like the importance of when you can really providing the context. Um, so I think, for example, we uh, recently did a, did a set of research um, and one of the pieces of information that was shared with us is um, often the women we were interviewing could be quite uncomfortable going directly into a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So we actually structured the day so that it started with a community building opportunity where everyone introduced themselves, they got to know one another. Um, if, if it had been in sort of a pre-COVID world, we probably would have had tea, right? Broken bread together um, and had that chance to kind of break the ice. And then we moved into one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, and we found that the data and the openness um, in terms of what was shared was, um, we were very surprised by how open the individuals were. And so I think similar to sort of what Alice is sharing, I think there are ways that you can create the right spaces to collect, um, mm -hmm. to collect good data. Um, I think one challenge is when you don't have the ability to set the context. So a survey or an SMS um, survey, right? You can't provide the color around how this data is going to be used, why we're asking it. So I think some of those, because they have a bit less of the human touch, um, can be a little bit harder to ensure that the data you're collecting is accurate. Um, and I think that, you know, the other sort of nuance in that is if it is coming from a partner organization and an individual is worried the partner organization will see what they said and interpret it in a certain way, right? So as much as it's great to work through partners, sometimes that can then color how someone chooses. Like let's say you're in a school network and, a, and you get a survey and it's asking something about the school you work at, right? If you're worried it's gonna get back to that school, um, then absolutely, right? As Amos shares, like it is possible someone would share something false because they're uncomfortable or concerned about who's asking the questions. Um, and so I think that's something to be really thoughtful about is who are you asking to share the information? Um, how are you setting context when possible um, so that you're able to ensure, right, that that data, there is a belief that that data will be private. Um, and I think Alice also named, right, there are some in the Data Protection Act, there are a couple of key sort of um, principles to follow in data collection. Um, but I think one of the really important ones is letting people know how that data will be used. And particularly um, if it is an anonymous survey, really helping them understand that no one will know who it is that said this particular information. Um, but I think that that can be, that can definitely be a barrier to getting the most accurate information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe I think- I can add something. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, Alice, uh, Claire. Please. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, creating a rapport with the, with the participants or the people that you're getting information with. And uh, in our case, we use uh, community volunteers. Those are people mm -hmm. in the community who are interacting with the, with the primary actors directly. So that they don't feel like they're giving the information to outsiders. Sometimes when uh, you seek to get this information, they might think that you have been sent by the government to check if they do their returns and so forth. But if it's someone from the community, then they will be able to create more rapport with them. Exactly. I, yeah, exactly. 
Um, and I think something else that came up uh, interesting, one of the challenges that we'll talk about before we move now into some additional learnings and tips and tricks, uh, was something we were discussing yesterday in our briefing around data minimization. Um, thank you, Alice, for teaching me the official term, um, which is uh, how to avoid data fatigue and how to avoid, um, you know, over... Um, over collecting data from from groups, especially if you're working through through partners. Um, so Emma, uh, you mentioned a good example yesterday. How and why is this a, a good but you know tough challenge? Yeah. Um, so when we were doing the data collection for Acumen, uh, we had a list of partners that we reached out to, and we had sort of we had a really clear structure. We had a letter we used to ask sort of who we are, why we're asking for the data, what we're hoping to do, shared our timeframes. Um, and one of the organizations came back and they're like, this is great. However, we shared a survey for another organization. I think it was like a month before. And they're like, we actually won't be sharing out any additional surveys for the next three to four months. Um, and they're like, it's just part of our practice to make sure that we like sort of manage the amount of surveys that are being sent um, to ensure pretty much that like, if something does get sent out, it's seen as important and more people will fill it out. Uh, and I think for them, they're like, look, we already did this work. If we do it again, they're just, they're tired from the last one. You're gonna get lower response rates. And frankly, like it just, they're like, it just doesn't feel like the right priority for us now. Um, but I thought it was a good sort of thing for us to think about, right, around, you know, how do we manage data fatigue? How do we make sure that, um, you know, we are sort of collecting um, the right data at reasonable times and we, you know, we're not sort of encouraging, oh, you just sent one out, it's okay, send this other one out, right? Um, and I know even you know from a from an ed tech East Africa perspective, uh, there was a lot of work done a couple of years ago to collect information about all of the ed tech organizations in East Africa. And unfortunately, that work ended up sort of pausing, and someone went to kick it back off about a year or two later, and everyone's like, "Wait, we already did that, right?" So I think there can be these moments where. Um, if you are sort of over surveying, people might be like, but I already answered that, right? And they may not know where it's coming from, things like that. So I think it's quite important um, that we're thoughtful about how we collect data. And if you're a company, right, um, and you work regularly with a group of people, uh, I think Alice sort of mentioned this earlier, but making sure that you're being thoughtful about when you're collecting that data um, that you have a very clear purpose for it. And it isn't just to collect, right? It isn't just to have some more stuff, right? But you've got a clear, we're using this to drive to a specific end goal. Um, and you're then able to make sure for those that you are asking for that data from, um, that they understand why you need it and what it's gonna be used for. Awesome. Alice, do you, have, do you have anything to add? Any other advice or guidance on that? Not for now. Mm, great. Um, well, thank you so much. I think we've, we've even started talking about some of the solutions and things to think about for some of these uh, for some of these challenges that we've identified. And in the last couple of minutes before we go to some more questions, um, from what you were saying, I came up with four major buckets of, of areas to think about how to improve our data collection processes, which were um, training our, our researchers um, and our data collectors, um, creating the data collection um, survey or implementation, what tools are we using, and then how do you gauge the population? So um, what I'd like our, our speakers to do uh, in the last couple of minutes before we go to questions is say, you know, what's your one major piece of advice for each of those four buckets? I'll guide us through it. You don't have to remember all four um, so that our, our audience can, uh, can learn from that. And then we can go into some of those questions. So I think um, the first question would be when you're thinking about training the, the researchers, upskilling, getting them ready to collect information from uh, your stakeholders and primary actors, what's the number one thing that people should do 
um, or number one uh, action that they should take. Um, Alice, do you want to go first on this one? Uh, I think the number one action that they should take is uh, first to identify the project and the performance indicators, mm -hmm. because uh, we are only collecting data that can inform decisions and uh, that can help us in, uh, in programming. So once the, the people collecting the data are able to understand the project and what you want to monitor, then uh, you can now identify the tools that you can use. And uh, according to the indicators, you'll be able to formulate the best tools and uh, you will ask the right questions and uh, probably use the, the right people to do the job. Mm. Excellent, yeah. So they have the context of what they're actually trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, and I think sort of to build, Alice, I'd say, right, like that picking the right team is hugely important um, because you wanna make sure that they uh, will be able to get the best data from those that they're speaking to. I think that's really important. I think the other piece that I would add is building the right set of tools for data collection. Um, so if I think about that, I think like building your interview guide, right? So all of the things that they need to be thinking about to set up the interview then right how do they actually kick off an interview with someone what are the specific questions being asked how do you close um if you're giving stipends for travel how do you manage that and then the next really important piece is you build the tools is how are you then taking that and synthesizing it to begin to actually use that data um, so i think i would say right focus on getting your tools uh, really strong so that you can then upskill your interviewers to use those tools. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then I think the, uh, the next question really was about, you know, then how are you designing those tools? I guess, how are you, um, what's, what's then the great piece of it? Your one big piece of advice around putting together the right survey or the right implementation plan. So in, uh, in getting the right, uh, the right surveys and uh, maybe getting the right information and uh, getting a smart data, we are using just the smart methodology of uh, S uh, standing for specific, getting the specific data that you need, and uh, then getting data that is measurable, uh, maybe in uh, both quantitative and qualitative manner. Three, getting data that is attainable and achievable. Uh, data that can be achieved and uh, data that is at least uh, realistic then getting the relevant uh, the relevant data that is required for the for the for the data set and uh, lastly getting data in a uh, uh, timely manner or timely bound manner so that you can uh, be able to assess the data in the right time and you are able to pass the same to the team so just following the the, the five the five ways of uh, smart data specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I really like that framework. I haven't actually thought about smart in the, the data framework before. The other piece for the focus group interviews um, is to make sure that I really understand what I get out at the end. What are sort of the, at the end of this data, I need to be able to go back to the client and say, these were the three key learnings, right? And I want to make sure that the questions I ask drive to that end goal. Um, and I think that that means I have to really clearly know what that end goal is. So if I don't, right, then it's that process of making sure I understand it and I align everything I do to getting the data to answer those specific questions at the end. Great, um, that's perfect. And then um, the, next, uh, the next bucket that goes along with this is now um, in the data collection tools themselves. We talked about digital versus paper. Um, we have a question um, from Stephen that also asks, how do you develop tools that will collect reliable data? What's uh, the big consideration or the big takeaway people should think about when they're looking at what are the actual tools that I'm using to capture this information? Uh, I think there are different uh, kind of tools that can be used depending on what you want to achieve. 
But in this digital era, I think I'm, uh, I'm recommending that we can use digital tools just to avoid so much paperwork and uh, wastage of uh, resources. Mm. Uh, uh, since we have, we, we, we have to accept that uh, every one of us has to be digitalized in a way, uh, including organizations. And uh, if we are able to, uh, to access uh, these digital tools and uh, have these uh, used in different programs, then this will minimize uh, cost in a, in a big way. And uh, maybe this is uh, these the right way to be able to get the right database for follow-up and uh, for future programming. So for mm. myself, I would uh, recommend digital tools versus the, the traditional paperwork. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think, you know, everything we do goes into a digital database. Um, so, you know, all of our notes from all of our, our interviews, all of the data collected during surveys, right? We put it all together so you can easily access it. Um, I think then, right, is the nuance of then how do you sort of, after you have lots of data, how do you then start to make sense of the data? Um, so for example, when we have researchers go out into the field, um, we then provide a tool for them to structure their reflections on the themes that came up, um, that could, like what kind of information did they collect, what types of questions came out from those that they spoke to. Um, so we sort of initially start with getting the researcher's perspective. Um, then we go through reviewing the data um, and basically determining how we're going to use it, right? So it might be we're going to put together a deck that walks you through key information with graphs, and we talk about why that's important. Or it might be we're using this to develop personas. So actually, the data is about how I read it, interpret it, and then turn it into uh, a persona. So I think there's a lot around making sure that you're thinking about about what's the end use of your data. Um, so you have it housed in the right place and then you look through your data to then help you to develop um, that sort of end product. Awesome. Um, and then the last bucket was now in engaging um, the right respondents and engaging uh, your, your, your population and your audience. Um, so we already had some tips already, uh, but anything else that uh, our audience should take away around how do I make sure that um, you know I'm, I'm putting the respondents in the right mindset or I'm getting the right information from them or I'm incentivizing them in the right way? So if I can respond to that, uh, I had done something small on uh, data, data protection policy uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, if we are getting data from uh, other sources and other people, we have to protect the data that we are getting. And in the data protection policy, let me, let me just try to share what I have. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, in the data protection policy, I'm looking at uh, one, the purpose of the policy. And the policy describes how, uh, how we collect data, uh, handle, transfer, store, protect personal data in compliance with the law and uh, data protection uh, standards globally. Then the data protect, we have uh, six data protection principles and uh, some of these principles are lawfulness, fairness and uh, transparency, sorry. In, uh, in this, we ensure that uh, personal data shall not be processed, uh, shall be processed lawfully, fair, fairly, and in a, in a transparent manner in a relation to the data subject. Then the, the purpose limitation, you only collect data that you're interested in. So you are guided by the purpose of the data. And uh, the third one is uh, data minimization, just minimize getting too much information that is irrelevant and that will not uh, help you achieve your objective. And then data accuracy, make sure the data is accurate and uh, it's kept up to date. Then the storage limitation, make sure that you only keep the data when it is required so that you do not have so many files in the office and some of them are, are not uh, necessary to the, to the programming. And the last one is on the issue of uh, integrity and confidentiality. Personal data shall be processed in a manner that, in a manner that ensures 
appropriate security of the personal data. Remember, this data belongs to uh, certain uh, persons and the data should be confidential. So in this case, you cannot go sharing out your data that you collected for programming. Anybody asking someone doing a campaign to become a governor, they ask for number of people in the, in the you have uh, you have uh, you have been working with. Then you provide the data with their numbers. Then they start calling them. So this ensures that in the confidentiality and integrity, you are not supposed to share this data with other source, uh, other uh, other people that are not. Uh, that are not uh, trusted and do not have uh, consent to that data. Then the last one is uh, children's personal data. Ensure that any data that you get from children, there's uh, a person that is uh, that will sign the consent. So obtain consent from the person that is probably the parent or the guardian, so that you may you may be compliant to the to the policy. So in the in a nutshell, if uh, you adhere to these policies then you'll make sure that the data that you are collecting is uh, in line with the purpose of uh, the purpose of the data thank you amazing and that is such a great place to start um yeah if 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 we're looking to do any sort of data collection making sure that at least we have just the the right policies in place so thank you so much alice for uh the great presentation showing all of us up who didn't come with presentations. <laughs> um, any Anything to add on your side, Emma? No. <laughs> great. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Alice and Emma for your great tips and your great advice and going through the challenges that um, you've had to face. Um, we have had a few questions coming in on the chat. Please put more. I know we have a few uh, a few minutes left, some of which we've uh, already addressed. But um, I think uh, Neil asked a good question uh, towards the beginning, which was once you have your data, how do you go about getting value from it? Um, so I guess once you you know bring all of the information together, you've gone through this process. Um, maybe what have you done in the process to set yourself up to get um, good action points, or how do you synthesize it? So either Emma or Alice, please feel free. Um, I'm happy to jump in. So I would say, right, when you sort of collected your data, I think if you sort of look at data as a holistic process um, and you start as Alice shared with the end in mind, right? What is the purpose of this data? How are you going to use it? And everything sort of flows backwards from there, right? So what tool you're going to use, the questions you're going to ask, the number of people you need to speak with, right? All of that then drives to the end of, right? How you use that data. Um, so I'd say if you're able to answer the question of like, uh, what questions do I need to answer in order to make a decision or to build a product or to whatever it is that you need that data for. Um, and then you build the tools around that. Then when you're sitting down and you've actually collected your data, right, you're going through it with the lens of how is it helping me to do X, to make this decision, to build this product. Um, so for example, um, it may be your, what you wanna figure out is um, the best way to, or what the specific product needs is of a certain group, right? So you go, you collect a lot of data from that group, and then you need to sit down and see what the data tells you, right? Um, you might find that it tells you something completely different than what you expected. So you thought you were gonna build a um, online, an app for this particular group, and you realize that they have feature phones, which means they don't have data, right? And all of a sudden, everything you're building is different than what you thought. Um, and so I think that that's the other part of the, the data synthesis is even if you have an idea in your head, you have to look at that data neutrally. You have to look at it and basically say, it's going to tell me a story. Even if it's not the one I want to hear, I have to, I have to accept that. Um, and so I think that's the other is like you can't try to make your data fit the thing you wanted if the data isn't doing that. Um, so I'd say that's the other sort of piece as you're thinking about interpreting your data. 
So maybe I can add something, uh, ensuring that we adhere to the data protection policy and uh, adhering also to data ethics. ethics. Uh, let us just ensure that uh, we follow the, the right procedures uh, so that we can have the right, uh, the right data and probably getting uh, the right information that will guide our, our programming and uh, maybe uh, for concept developments. I've seen someone asking what, uh, how we can use the data. The data can be used for research, for concept uh, development and uh, several other ways to inform uh, various programming. If we do not have data, then we cannot know what is happening in the world. So data informs a lot of information and policy making. And uh, let us ensure that we get, we get the right data so that we are able to get the right solutions in the world. Thank you so much, uh, Alice and Emma. I think um, with that, we've actually captured and covered a lot of uh, a lot of the questions in the chat. And I really don't think there's anything else um, to add on from the great uh, almost parting shot from you, Alice. Um, so we're uh, at this point. We'll I think we'll wrap it up. Um, we're a minute past uh, past the hour. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you so much again um, to Alice and to Emma for your great advice, for your great uh, openness and sharing your challenges and some of your learnings. Um, I've definitely learned a lot. I'm sure the rest of our audience has too. Um, and we're really excited to continue to work together to find better ways to get the right information and share that information out um, with individuals across uh, and organizations across, uh, across the region. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much too to our great audience. We really appreciate your time. We'll be sending out a recording um, of this uh, webinar as well as um, contact information in case you want to reach out uh, to Alice or to Emma or any of us. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. So thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.